But now, the high-tech face of battle makes war less and less of an option. Or does it? Will man yet fight the ultimate war? On the world tomorrow, David Hume. Korea, Vietnam, Central America, Afghanistan, the Gulf. All war zones in the contemporary world. Some a fading memory, some a present frightening reality. In all of man's recorded history, less than 300 years have been battle-free. War has been man's ultimate attempt to settle his differences. I say has been because now it seems that even war itself has become too destructive. Man has sought out ever more powerful means to solve national and international arguments. He's devised such weapons that can leave no one the real winner and everyone the loser. Have we reached the point in man's history the Bible describes as the time of the end? It used to be that the religious fanatic on the street corner with his handheld placard prepare to meet thy doom, was considered out of touch. But now his message seems more meaningful by the day. Despite arms limitation agreements and all of the hype that goes with public displays of international cooperation, we'd better face up to the facts. This world is on a collision course. Now there is a way out, and we will focus on that during today's program, The War Game. But first, let's trace some important steps in the arms race and the development of modern war's nuclear weaponry. Man's journey toward his ultimate weapon, the hydrogen bomb, really began in 1920. New Zealand physicist Ernest Rutherford succeeded in changing nitrogen atoms into hydrogen and oxygen. He bombarded them with speeding alpha particles. Then in 1939, Otto Hahn, a German physicist, finally split the uranium nucleus and released a small amount of energy. Here was the beginning of a race among the nations, a race to produce a series of regulated nuclear chain reactions. The first such controlled chain reaction took place at the University of Chicago in 1942 under the direction of Italian scientist Enrico Fermi. Many nationalities were involved in the research program that led to the first nuclear bomb. And of course, several nations were striving to be first on the scene with such a mega weapon. Both Germany and Japan were pursuing their own studies, but by a combined effort, the Allied powers won the race. By July 1945, the first atomic bomb had been tested at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Less than one month later, during the early hours of August 6, 1945, a United States B-29 bomber, the Enola Gay, took off on a secret mission. It was destined to be a watershed in human affairs. In the aircraft's bomb bay was an atomic device nicknamed Little Boy. Coming in over Hiroshima from the northwest at 28,000 feet, the plane dropped its load and sped away. The bomb fell for 43 seconds until it detonated just above a city medical center, vaporizing it instantly. Looking back on the carnage, the rapidly spreading fires and the enormous plume of dust and smoke forming its mushroom shape, co-pilot Robert Lewis wrote in the log, my God, what have we done? As I said, many were working on the development of the A-bomb on both sides. Our purpose in this program is not to naively apportion blame in a very complex situation. It's rather to show how we got to where we are and how we can be protected in the years ahead. Visiting Hiroshima today is both a sobering and an encouraging experience. Along with the shocking reality of what happened, you sense a determination among the survivors to prevent a repetition of the events of August 6th. What follows are impressions of Hiroshima, its mood, its survivors, and the lessons it teaches in human terms. 
The sequence you're about to see includes some graphic reminders of that terrible day in 1945. If you're sensitive to such scenes, then please be warned. The Hiroshima of today is a new city of 850,000, modern, clean, and bustling with activity. With its wide streets, traffic, and shops, there's little to remind anyone of the fact that this was the first city to suffer atomic attack. The only building left today as a reminder of that terrible morning stands in ruins. It's the old industry promotion hall. It now serves as a well-recognized memorial of the Hiroshima that was destroyed. Nearby the ruined exhibition hall is a peace park and a memorial museum. It's hard to believe that this beautiful park was once at the very center of the atomic holocaust. It's become a place of pilgrimage for the Japanese. Thousands of school children come here from all over the country to pay their respects to the dead and to express their hopes and dreams for a secure future. The Peace Museum attracts visitors the world over. It has all of the shocking memorabilia of man's first real experience of nuclear war, including paintings by children who survived. The museum's director is Yoshitaka Kawamoto. He's also a survivor of the original A-bomb attack. Standing by a large relief model of devastated Hiroshima, he recounted for us his experiences as a schoolboy on the morning of the bomb. When the bomb was dropped, the students, myself among them, were just entering the classroom. One of my friends pointed to the window, saying he could see a B-29 in the sky. I was sitting at a desk and was about to stand up to see the airplane. I think that was the moment of impact. A blue-white light flashed in my eyes. It probably lasted only a few seconds. I don't remember anything after that. The flash was the only memory that I have of the blast. When I came to, it was pitch dark. I was pinned under a lot of debris and could not move. I could hear only sobbing and children's cries for their mothers. I also remember hearing some of my classmates sing our school song. I'm not too good at singing, but I can still sing my school song from the first verse to the last. I think I joined in the singing with a loud voice. After a while, the voices died away one by one. My friends were dying one by one, till I was the only one left singing. And yet, no help arrived. I pushed away the obstructions as I inched out. I think I struggled and crawled with all my might for an hour or so. When I could finally stick out my neck, I realized for the first time the magnitude of the destruction. I found that my arm was injured. A piece of wood, about a foot long, was stuck on it. But the flesh had stuck to it, and it would not budge. So I took out my towel I had hanging around my hip, and tied it around my arm as a tourniquet. Then I pulled out the piece of wood. I also found that three of my teeth were broken off. That was all other than my arm. The fire was closing in, and I decided to escape, but I didn't know where to run. I thought the playground would be a safe place from the fire. I ran in the direction of the playground in the heat of the fire. All around me were the bodies of school children about 8,400 of them from all over Hiroshima, who had been working there at the time of the blast. They weren't all dead. Some of them tried to hang on to my ankles, pleading with me to take them with me. I had to push them aside and walk on. I still carry with me the horrible guilt of leaving them behind. The place to which I finally reached was this bridge. I think it was about two and a half hours after the impact of the bomb. As I remember, from here on was a sea of fire. The river was full of corpses and one could not see the surface of the river. People were jumping into the water one after another. Avoiding the floating bodies, I drank from the river and fainted right there on the edge of the water. When I came to, it was about seven o'clock at night. 
The Japanese army trucks were coming to the river to rescue people and take them to a big warehouse on the beach. I found myself lying in the warehouse. Thus, my life was saved. But after about a week, my hair began to fall away and my nose bled continuously for almost 48 hours. For three months, I was blind. I could not stand for a year. I was lucky that my 13-year-old body was strong enough to survive all that. There is one more thing I would like to say, especially to you, the young children. That is that you, the children of the 21st century, understand what happened in Hiroshima accurately and live your lives in the light of that understanding. That is the one thing the Holocaust in Hiroshima should still be remembered for. I remind you that if Hiroshima is ever repeated, it will be an event that will mark the end of the human race. People have differing opinions about the bombing of Hiroshima and its significance in bringing an end to World War II in the Far East. But it's impossible to deny the reality of nuclear war's terrible destructiveness. August 6, 1945 was man's first experience of nuclear war. Yoshitaka Kawamoto's story would have been told by perhaps an American or an Australian or a Briton if the Allies had not been first to assemble the bomb. Our point is simply this, nuclear war is hell. And many of us rightly worry that our planet will be destroyed by an all-out nuclear war. But it won't end this way. Mankind will survive. There is good news, and we want to share that with you in this remarkable free booklet, The World Won't End This Way. It gives reassurance that despite all we've seen so far, there is hope for man. We live today in very anxious times, and we need to understand just how serious they are. This booklet explains how we got to this point in history, and it shows what's to come. As I said, there is hope. This free companion booklet, World Peace, How It Will Come, will tell you why. World Peace is coming. This important booklet explains just how peace will finally break out on this planet. Despite all the horrors we face today, there's hope you can put your confidence in. Why not request your free copy of these two publications, The World Won't End This Way and World Peace, How It Will Come. They're yours free of charge, no cost and no obligation. Along with them, if you're not already a subscriber, we'll be sending you a free trial subscription to the Plain Truth magazine. This unique news magazine gives exclusive insight into world events. There's no subscription price, and you can have it free for as long as you like. I'll be offering these pieces of literature again at the end of today's program. Well, let's continue with our look at the development of ever more powerful nuclear weapons. Within seven years of the world's first use of atomic weaponry, an even more powerful bomb had been built. This one used the atomic bomb as its fuse. It was, of course, the hydrogen bomb. It was exploded for the first time by the United States on November 1st, 1952. One year later, the Soviet Union joined the U.S. in possession of this awesome weapon. Today, the nuclear powers possess 50,000 such weapons, when just a few hundred would be sufficient to devastate the world we know. 50,000 nuclear warheads are enough to produce well over one million Hiroshimas. Theoretically, the world's stockpiled nuclear megatonnage could kill 58 billion people. That's everyone now alive 12 times over. But it's hard for us to grasp that just one modern bomb has as much destructive power as all of the explosives used so far in all of man's history. Just one bomb, as destructive as everything that's ever been used before. Saying it yet another way, right now the nuclear powers of the equivalent of several tons of TNT hanging over the heads of every man, woman and child on Earth today. Since World War II, the nuclear powers have spent between three and four trillion dollars on their nuclear arsenals. That's three to four trillion dollars to commit suicide if ever they're used. 
Now, the way human nature is, it seems unlikely that they won't be used in some way or other. Look at this quote from Thomas Power's book, Thinking About the Next War. Up until now, the world's great armies have always gone to war sooner or later. The great fleet of Darius, the Roman legions, the Spanish Armada, and the Wehrmacht were all intended for war. And that is what they were used for. Why should the present situation end any differently? Which brings us to the question, is man's problem nuclear weapons or is man's problem himself? Nuclear weapons and their after effects do pose the threat of the annihilation of the human race. They have changed the world. But the way we think is the real crux of the problem. Albert Einstein recognized this. He said, nuclear weapons have changed everything except our mode of thinking. And British journalist and author Malcolm Muggeridge has written this. Since the beginning of the Second World War, Western society has experienced a complete abandonment of its sense of good and evil. The true crisis of our time has nothing to do with monetary troubles, unemployment, or nuclear weapons. The true crisis has to do with the fact that Western man has lost his way. The Bible does explain why we have war, and it's so utterly simple and direct. James chapter 4 and verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? So it's a matter of the heart of man, his innermost being. General Douglas MacArthur experienced warfare in a way most have not. And as the architect of post-war Japan's reconstruction, he saw the reality of nuclear war's aftermath firsthand. Here's what he said in his farewell address to Congress. I know war as few other men now living know it, and nothing to me is more revolting. Men since the beginning of time have sought peace, military alliances, balances of power, leagues of nations, all in turn failed, leaving the only path to be by way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war now blocks this alternative. The problem basically is theological. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. He said the problem is basically theological. It so happens that the Bible also has much to say about 20th century warfare and its solution. The information is contained in little understood prophetic passages written for our time. Towards the end of his ministry, Christ was asked about the end of the world or age as it should be. He replied to his disciples' questions by prophesying a series of events. They culminate in the greatest time of trouble the world will experience. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved alive. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The possibility of no flesh being saved alive has only come since the advent of the hydrogen bomb. The after effects of nuclear war mean catastrophic changes in the world's environment. Now we might debate whether every single person would be killed or whether all plant life would perish, but the point is clear. Annihilation is now possible from the immediate and long-term effects of nuclear warfare as Christ said it would be. On Armistice Day, 1948, U.S. General Omar Bradley made this penetrating statement. We have grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. The world has achieved brilliance without wisdom, power without conscience. Ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. We know more about war than we know about peace, more about killing than we know about living. So you see, a fundamental change in man's mind is needed. Einstein had it right when he said on another occasion, the real problem is in the hearts and minds of men. It is easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit in man. Man's skills have outstripped his morals. Plutonium is denatured by adding certain materials to it so that it can't be used to build a nuclear device. Complete denaturing is physically impossible. Yet Einstein said it was easier to denature plutonium than to render the evil human spirit harmless. 
Will the necessary spiritual change come in time? The answer is yes. In time to prevent all-out annihilation by war and its long-term effects on the environment, but not before great difficulty, trial, and tribulation. There is good news, but first the Bible shows there's a lot more bad, and yet there is a way of escape. War is symbolized in the book of Revelation this way. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now notice the high-tech war described here affects many people, but not all, and that the environment is not harmed, as we see now in verse 4. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So here, some specific people are protected. Those who have the seal of God, those whom God himself will protect. Now, we might speculate about the kinds of weapons being used here. Are they biological, or chemical, or something we don't know about yet? They're certainly not nuclear as we know them. Verses 5 and 6 say this, And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Chemical and biological weapons are still under development. In fact, a Soviet spokesman reminded us of this frightening fact during the week of Mikhail Gorbachev's visit to Washington. Valentin Fallon is head of the Soviet press agency Novosti. He said this, We won't copy you anymore making planes to catch up with your planes, missiles to catch up with your missiles. We'll take asymmetrical means with new scientific principles available to us. Genetic engineering could be a hypothetical example. Things can be done for which neither side could find defenses or countermeasures, with very dangerous results. If you develop something in space, we could develop something on Earth. These are not just words. I know what I'm saying. So what is the way of escape from coming events, many of them specifically prophesied in the Bible? In a nutshell, the way of escape is simply this. We have to come under God's protection. We have to find out what He requires of us. How are we to live? What should our relationship with Him be? And then we have to start living that way and persevere in it. Here's the promise of protection He gives if we'll do that. It's also in the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 10. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. According to these same prophecies, that hour of trial will bring death to one-third of mankind. It's the result of a terrible ordeal brought on man by his own hand. And Jesus Christ will have to intervene in world affairs to prevent man from annihilating himself. That, too, is prophesied. The ultimate war will be fought, but man will not be allowed to end all human life. Christ said those days would be cut short. Christ also tells us what to do now to escape. He said it in Luke chapter 21 and verse 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Yes, there is a way out, a way of escape, and it's open to everyone who will take the steps to form a right relationship with God, because only God's protection is going to be good enough in the times yet ahead. You don't need to fear nuclear war and its aftermath. You can escape. This free literature will help you understand how. The world won't end this way explains, despite all we've seen today, that man will survive. This could be one of the most important booklets you will ever read. It could be the key to your survival in the years ahead. And it's free. Shouldn't you consider what it has to say? Along with it, you should also read this booklet, World Peace, How It Will Come. It's also free of charge with no obligation. It gives you the timetable for the end of war and the beginning of a much-anticipated era of lasting peace on Earth. 
It's one of the most hope-filled, positive booklets you could read. Along with these booklets, we'll also be sending you, if you're not already a subscriber, a free trial subscription to The Plain Truth, a magazine of understanding. Printed in seven languages, The Plain Truth is read by millions of people every month. The Plain Truth explains what other magazines and newspapers cannot. It shows you how God's Word is relevant in today's modern world. It also shows you who and what you are and what world events really mean. Because The Plain Truth magazine looks at these events in the light of Bible prophecy. Now, we've nothing to sell on the World Tomorrow program. All of our literature is yours, free for the asking, free of charge, no cost, no obligation whatsoever. We're simply not going to ask you for money. So for a free subscription to The Plain Truth and the free booklets, The World Won't End This Way, and World Peace, How It Will Come, please telephone for the cost of a local call, 008 that's 008 We have many operators waiting, but if you don't get through right away, call us again in 10 or 15 minutes. That's 008 Or if you prefer to write, then send your request to The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. That's The World Tomorrow. GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Next week on The World Tomorrow, David Albert will take you to Australia, this year celebrating its bicentenary. Australia today is an exciting country, a prosperous, peaceful land with unique wildlife and friendly people who enjoy one of the world's highest standards of living. But all is not well in the land down under. At this time, when Australians would rather be enjoying their 200th anniversary, they're facing problems with the economy and unsettling questions about their national identity. Don't miss next week's program, What Next for Australia? Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hume for The World Tomorrow. For the free literature offered on this program, write The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008 074 222. That's The World Tomorrow.